So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We can choose to live in captivity or we can choose to live in freedom. It's not just about our eternity. It is about our eternity. Jesus died so that we could have an eternity in fellowship with the Father, so that we could be reconciled to him, so that the sin and the distance that our sin created in our relationship in him, that gap would be closed because of what he did. So we have eternity with Jesus. We have eternity with God the Father because of Jesus, because of what he did. And also, we have freedom in life here while we're still on this earth because we have the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Pax Christian Church podcast. We are so glad you've joined us today and we pray that this message speaks to you and encourages you and challenges you to live for Jesus with everything that you have. Stick around after the message. We'd love to find out how we can connect with you and be praying for you. Here's this week's message from our Sunday gathering. All right, so we are still in the book of John. And this morning as I was, um, not this morning as I was preparing, but as I was preparing for this morning, uh, I was just thinking about what it was like before I was a Christian and and what it was like to not know of my need for Jesus. And what it was like to sort of not understand my sin. And I remember those days. I became a Christian in high school. Um, I remember what my life was like before Jesus. I remember that I thought I was a pretty good person. So check. Um, I remember that there were certain things that were really important to me about who I was. Like I was a swimmer in high school and that was good. I love it. I'm not ever going to knock on swimming or sports. I love them. I think they're valuable. But I will tell you that they did teach me that I was very capable. Um, And I was very capable of, if I just tried hard enough um, and worked hard enough and practiced long enough, I could do it on my own. Like, I could get it. I could get there. And if you had asked me what my life was like, I'd say it was pretty good. But the reality of my life before Jesus is that I lived with a lot of fear and I lived with a lot of shame and I lived with a lot of darkness and I lived with a lot of hopelessness. And that was a 14-year-old, 15-year-old kid. But I wouldn't have known that the answer to those things was Jesus. And if you had asked me if I needed Jesus, I probably would have told you, no, I don't really need Jesus. I wasn't really aware of what Jesus did for me. I wasn't really aware of my need for him or what he had to offer. I was interested in spiritual things. I was searching for more. I knew there was something more, but I didn't know what that was, and I was turning to a lot of things to find that fulfillment, to find that truth and that hope that I saw in other people. Jesus tells his disciples, if you hold on to my teaching, you're really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And the truth was I didn't even know I needed to be free. And he set me free anyway. And so this morning, I would implore you, I would ask you, if you were a Christian, to just think back to those days before you knew God, before you knew Jesus, and think about what your life was like, and consider the freedom that you've been walking in since you met Jesus. And if you do not know Jesus, I would really consider you to ask the question, Who is he? And why do I need him? Those questions led me straight to him. As Christians, we get a bad rap sometimes. And sometimes rightly so. I mean, we don't always do what we should do. 
But the term Christian has never really been a popular term, even giving it to us to be named by. You know, we were followers of the way originally, and Christian was actually a derogatory term that was assigned to Christianity for people who followed the teaching and the ways of Jesus. But to be a Christian is to be a disciple of Jesus, and to be a disciple of Jesus is to be someone who follows Jesus and who follows his teachings and his ways in this world. And those are important things to remember as we dig into the, into the text today. So we are going to pick up our study today in the book of John, chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 30 which is at the bottom of my page, 31, in verse 31. We're going to read through it, and we're going to pray, and then we're going to go through it piece by piece and really see what the Lord would tell us today and speak to us and ask of us today. Jesus has been teaching the people, and one of the things that he highlighted last week is that he is the only way. <laughs> he is the only way to salvation. You have to have faith in him to be saved. And Brian talked about that a lot last week, and this week he's going to expand on this a little bit. He says this, he says in verse 31, it says, To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that, you, that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, Jesus says, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. You want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding on to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason that you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, that you gave us a way to know the Father, that you gave us a way to know God, that the only way to know him is through faith in you. Jesus, speak truth to our hearts this morning. Let us have ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts with room in them to accept your words today. Holy Spirit, would you convict our hearts and challenge us to hear the words of Jesus and to remain in them. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, so we're going to go through. There are a couple of things here that I really want to talk to you about today. So, all right. Also, if you have the Bible app on your phone, all the notes 
are in there, and last I checked, it was working. So you can follow along there, or we'll have the verses up on the screen as well. Okay, so John 8.31 starts out this way. It says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Remember, disciples are people who follow a teacher. They follow in his teaching. They live according to those teachings. They follow in his way. So their lives eventually reflect whatever teacher they're following. Okay? So if you're really my disciples, you're going to follow me. If you're really my disciples, he says, if you hold to my teaching, you will, you will be my disciples. To be a follower of Jesus, we have to hold to his teaching. What does that even mean? It's really interesting. What this phrase, hold to, um, the transliteration is the word mino, and it means to continue in or abide or dwell. And the word used there for teaching is logos, and it means, it means word or teaching or message. So he says, if you abide in my teachings, if you dwell in my word, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He's calling them to take hold of his teachings, to follow his leading, to live according to what he's calling them to. When they start doing that, they're going to understand in deeper, deeper ways their need for him. And we find that as Christians when we first put our faith in Jesus, we don't know much about him. But the more time we spend in his word, the more time we spend getting to know his teachings, the more clearly we see him and understand who he was and what he did for us and how he calls us to live that out in this world. And he's calling these new believers into something deeper because he's talking to people who are Jews who have put their faith in him, okay? And he's telling them this. If they're really, if they hold to his teaching, they will really be his disciples and then they're going to know the truth and that truth is going to set them free. They're going to know what they've been given. Verse 33 says, They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Okay. Okay, guys. There are some things you need to know about the descendants of Abraham. One, they were slaves once. Okay? They were. They were slaves in Egypt. And not only were they slaves in Egypt, but God told Abraham that they would be. And he told Abraham not only that they would be, but that he would deliver them after 400 years. And God did that. It was, it was the story of Moses in the Bible. Most people in our world know this story. They know about Moses. They know about the parting of the Red Sea. I don't think it went that way, but... Um, <laughs> They know about the parting of the Red Sea. They know about what God did for his people, that he brought them up out of Egypt. He delivered them from slavery into freedom. These are Abraham's descendants. That's part of their identity as a people. God says, don't ever forget that. Don't ever have slaves of your own. Don't ever reject the foreigner because you were once foreigners in a land. You were once slaves in a land. This is part of their identity. And they're like... We're Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves. Why would you say we need to be free? Also, they're currently under Roman rule and Roman oppression, not living in the freedom that God's people were meant to have as his nation. They've become comfortable with this, but they are claiming a status. They're claiming a right they're claiming a way of life and integrity. And they're saying they've never been slaves. And they're missing the point. I feel like sometimes we should call these conversations with the Pharisees adventures and missing the point. I know that's a book, sorry. That's a different book. But, but I mean, really, that's just what they keep doing. They keep 
missing it. He says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They don't say, what truth do we need to know? They say, we're not slaves. We don't need to be free. They don't know that they need freedom. They don't even know what they need to be saved from. John 8, 34, Jesus replies to them and he says, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. All right, now before I was a Christian, if you had told me that everyone sins, I would have been like, thanks, jerk. I would have. I don't like to say things like that on the stage, but I did. Okay, um, I would have written you off. I would have been like, judgy much, whatever, you know? Thanks a lot. I don't need that in my life. Here's the deal. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It is the state of humanity. Sin is the state of humanity. It is the state that we live in without the forgiveness of Christ. And it began in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned and fell short of God's plan for them. Sin is anything in our lives that keeps us out of relationship with God. And we see in the garden that that's exactly what happened. They disobeyed the law, the command that God gave them, and they got moved out of relationship with God because of it. Because their sin separated them from God. And we have been living in that state since then. And what we also see about sin is that it doesn't only affect their relationship, their direct relationship with God, but it affects immediately their relationship with one another. And sin does that to us too. It separates us from God and one another. And we live our lives in this state of sin. And we know this, like, we know this, inherently we know this, because we experience it. We experience the repercussions of our sin every day. We experience disconnected and broken relationships. We experience difficulties in the workplace. We experience friction with one another all the time. We understand that this is right, but we, and we try to fix it, right? We have lots of ways around this. We have lots of coping mechanisms. You know, passive aggressiveness is not a good coping mechanism, but it's used. We have lots of ways of bending to the will of other people to make things easy and nice. But the reality is, the issue there is it's broken because of sin. And Jesus says, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. You think you're free, but you're not. You think you're free, but you're not. And I want to ask you this morning, how many people do you know who were like me, walking around having no idea that what we think is freedom is really captivity? How many people do you know who are slaves to sin and have no idea that that's really what's happening in their lives? Jesus came to set us free from that so that we could have freedom in that. If you had told me I needed to be set free, though, I don't think I would have believed you. I wouldn't have believed that. I would have known I needed something, but I wouldn't have known it was that. I didn't understand what sin was or that it had control over me in my life. And I didn't understand that in chasing after perfection and being a good person and chasing after my own selfish ambition, my own vain conceit, my own pride, I didn't understand that I was elevating those things in a way that they became my idols. I was worshiping those things and I was following those things and I was a disciple of this world and this morality, and the things that they tell us that we should follow. I was following those things, and I was living that way. And you could tell. You knew it by looking at my life. And that was so messy and hard. It was so difficult. 
It was exhausting. And that's kind of what these people are doing. They have the law. They follow Abraham. They have their set of righteous rules and responsibilities and things that they do. And they are following those things and they don't realize that they are not free. That they are not free. It isn't enough to be children of Abraham and just religious. And it's the same for us today. We aren't saved by associated faith. We're not saved because our parents were saved. We're not saved because we go to church. We're not saved because we claim <laughs> because we claim good works or because we're from a certain place or we have the right job or we're a good person. Those things don't save us. Jesus saves us. Earlier in chapter 8 in verse 24, Jesus says, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. You will indeed Die in your sins. Jesus teaches us that if we do not believe in him, we are not saved. We will die in our sins. We will not turn. And we need to if we want everlasting life. But it's more than just about everlasting life. Because here, here, he says, everyone who sins is a slave to sin and then he says, now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We can choose to live in captivity or we can choose to live in freedom. It's not just about our eternity. It is about our eternity. Jesus died so that we could have an eternity in fellowship with the Father, so that we could be reconciled to him, so that the sin and the distance that our sin created in our relationship in him, that gap would be closed because of what he did. So we have eternity with Jesus. We have eternity with God the Father because of Jesus, because of what he did. And also, we have freedom in life here while we're still on this earth because we have the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ. We do not have to live as slaves. Slaves have no permanent place in a family. They can be bought, they can be sold, they can be exchanged or set free. And, and the son is the one who has the authority. He is one who has authority in the family to set a slave free. So he says, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And Jesus is saying, make no mistake, he is the son. He is the son that can set you free. He is the son that has come to set humanity free in this earth, in this time, in our lives, and in eternity forever. Amen. For all time. Jesus is the son who has come to set us free from the bondage of sin. John 8, 37, he says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. I love it when Jesus is like, I know, guys. I know who you are. I know that you're Abraham's descendants. Yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. They have no room for the truth that Jesus is bringing them because they have filled up all of that space with things that don't belong there, with religiosity, with spirituality, with whatever else they're worshiping, with whatever else they're believing. They have no room for Jesus. They have brought things in that do not belong. And because they have, those things are taking up that space. And our sin does that in our lives. We become so attached to our sin that sometimes we have no room for Jesus. We become so attached to the things that we want, the things that we are concerned with, the things that worry us, the things that cause us fear and anxiety, that we have no room left to abide and remain in his teachings. Because we are too busy 
We are too busy being distracted, trying to figure out how to respond to all this stuff, when if we would just go to his word and study his ways and follow the way he lived, we would find that the road would be so much straighter, the path so much easier, the burden so much lighter, because Jesus says that when we give him our burdens, he'll carry for him. He'll carry them for us, and he'll put his yoke on us, and his burden is light. What he asks us to carry is light. He does the heavy lifting. He says, I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence. That's verse 38. I'm telling you what I've seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your Father. Uh Uh-oh. What? Okay. So, So far, these people are with him, right? Like, they're like, well, Abraham's our father. And he's like, no. Abraham's not your father. Abraham's not your father because you are looking for a way to kill me. And that is not something that Abraham would do. You must not know Abraham. Abraham was called a friend of God. Abraham entertained angels. When the messengers who brought the word of God to Abraham came to to him, he did not try to kill him. That is not who Abraham was. So they must not be following their father, Abraham. They are not walking in his ways. And over and over again, we read in the Bible this phrase, he followed in the ways of his father. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, or he did good in the eyes of the Lord. If you have been reading the Bible reading plan with us, and we've been going through the book of Kings, and we've been reading about these kings over and over again, a king's whole reign, his whole life is described in in a few words sometimes. It's, he followed in the ways of his father, which means he did all the things that that man did, and either it was evil, or or it was righteous, and he followed in the ways, usually when they say, He followed in the ways of someone righteous. It's David, King David. He followed in the ways of his father, David. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. This, when we're talking about who their fathers are, it's about who they're following. It's about how that is showing in their lives. The way that they're living is showing, and they are trying to kill Jesus. You know what I love? They don't even address this part. They, like, ignore this whole thing that he says that they're trying to kill him. And they're very concerned about themselves, okay? He says, so he says, you, if you were Abraham's descendants, you wouldn't be trying to kill me, right? So, 38, I'm telling you what I have seen in my father's presence. You are doing what you have learned, what you have heard from your father. John 8, 39 says, they respond with Abraham is our father. Not, we're not trying to kill you, Jesus, They are so concerned about their own identity here. And they are identifying with Abraham. And they're like, how dare you say that Abraham is not, like that we, that we do not know Abraham. He is our father. We follow him. We are his people. And this declaration is as much a declaration about lineage as it is about their character, about their integrity, about their importance and value as a people. They are claiming allegiance to Abraham. They are his. And Jesus is like, mm, you have a different father. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you're looking for a way to kill me. A man who's told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. And they say, we are not illegitimate children. That's their response to that. We are not illegitimate children. How dare you say we have another father? Like, did you just say that? Like, we're Ill, like that we, mom had two guys. What? No, we are not illegitimate children. Do not question our value. Don't do that. The only father we have is God himself. But they seem to catch what Jesus is trying to tell them that they're following someone else by their actions. And so they escalate. They go, okay, well, you know what? Fine. God is our father. See what he does with that. (laughs) If only they understood. 
if only they had room for what Jesus was trying to tell them. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. If they were children of God, if God was their father, they would follow in the ways of God. They would live lives that resembled a people who follow in the ways of God. They would reflect God in this earth. They would not be trying to kill Jesus. They would not be trying to kill anyone. They wouldn't even be trying to stone people because they would recognize that justice belongs to the Lord, that it is his to bring. And yet here they are, not denying it, that this is what they're trying to do, not shying away from the reality that, yeah, we're trying to kill you, dude. They never once refute this. But if they were, if if God was their father, they would love Jesus because they would love the things of God. And Jesus is from God, and he's telling them that. Jesus said, if you abide in his word, if you remain in it, then you know the truth, and that truth is going to set you free. But they cannot even hear his teachings because they have no room for it much less abide or remain in him because they are identifying with and following a different father. And Jesus is telling them that. He says, you belong to your father, the devil. Okay, if you had told me I was following the devil, I'd been like, "Ah, I'm a good person. So funny because like people understand, they might not say, they, people might say like God's not real, but they're like, oh yeah, the devil. Yeah, I know who that is. Okay. I don't know why people are more willing to admit that he's real than God sometimes. I don't understand that. But Jesus knows he's real. He says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. The devil has desires for this earth and for your life. Do not be mistaken. Do not assume that he is a fairy tale. Do not assume that he is not real and is not interested in thwarting the plans of heaven. You are an important part of the kingdom of heaven. You have a place in God's kingdom and he has a plan for your life on this earth. And if the devil can twist it and take it and steal it from you, he will. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to truth for there is no truth in him. Jesus is very clearly telling them, because you want to kill me, you are following in the ways of your father. Who's been a murderer from the beginning? These are his characteristics that you were showing, not the characteristics of God. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. It's a commandment that we're like, oh, that's not a big one. Do not lie. And yet, he is the father of lies. There is, their father is not Abraham. That's what he's saying. It's just like, Your father's not Abraham. Your father is not God. Your father is the devil. You are allowing him to twist truth in your life. You are following after his ways. And it shows in their actions. It shows in their desire to kill Jesus. It shows in their desire to pass judgment on him and everyone else that they try to pass judgment on. They're willing to violate their own commandments to bring justice. Thou shalt not kill That is a twisting of God's word to then turn around and try to kill Jesus. How they justify that can only be following after the father of lies. And the thing that we have to realize today is that Jesus is telling them the way you live shows who you follow. And for us today, that's still true. The way we live shows who we follow. And I'm not telling you to go through some sort of like 
character modification or behavior modification process. Like, I'm not telling you right now that Jesus is like, you should not do this. You should not do that. You should not do this. He says, love me. He says, if you love me, you will obey my command. But you start by loving Jesus. And here he's saying, you start by abiding in his teachings. You have to know what matters to Jesus to follow him. You have to know what matters to the heart of God to live it out well. You have to. If you don't, then all you will be following is the father of lies. The only truth that you will find is the truth that our world will give you if you do not get into the word of God and read the Bible and read who Jesus was and actually what he did and said. And that is why we are going through the book of John so slowly. That is why we go through scripture verse by verse because we know that it doesn't matter how many examples we give you. It doesn't matter how many life illustrations we give you. The truth is in the word of God and it is the truth that will set us free. And we cannot know the truth if we are not reading the Bible. And that is true. That is, that, that is immutable. It does not change and it has not changed. We cannot please God if we are not in his word because we will not know how. We will not know what he desires from us. And we will elevate all the wrong things and we will put all of the wrong things in his place. We will come up with all of our own ideas about what is right and what is wrong. And we will decide because humanity loves authority, our own authority. We will decide what is right and wrong. And we know that's true because all you have to do is watch the news or spend five minutes in Starbucks listening to other people talk. And you will know humanity is deciding what is true. Humanity is deciding what is right and wrong right now. But we've been given the truth. And it's in the word of God. And all we have to do is pick up the book and read it and remain in it, abide in God's word. Think about what it means. Pray for God's revelation of his word. John 8, 45 says this. Jesus says, yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. They've been leaving, they have been believing lies for so long that when they hear the truth of God, they don't know it. They don't recognize it. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? I am telling the truth. Why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Lord, let us have ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts that are open that would listen to your word and live it out. Jeremiah prophesies, and it's repeated in Hebrews 10, that this is the covenant, God says, this is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, after their time of destruction and judgment. He says, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. You cannot follow God without knowing what he desires of you. And he wants that to be written in our hearts, not just known in our thoughts and in our minds, not just understood on an intellectual level. He has given us the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit to reveal his word and his truth to us, to convict our hearts so that our very hearts would change and be different because of what Jesus did for us. So that... <clears throat> When we say we're Christians, when we say we are Christ followers, our lives would begin to reflect who we follow because it is part of our very being. Do you love the word of God so much? Do you love Jesus so much that his word has become part of who you are? Are you taking his word and jumping off a springboard and deciding what that means for everyone else? 
and deciding what is right in our world and what is acceptable, he's already said what is right and acceptable. We don't need to come up with it on our own. It's here. But we have to start with a heart that is trying to know him, not trying to figure out this. We have to start with a heart that desires to know who this Jesus is. I got a hold of this book before I became a Christian. Someone gave me, I, I've, I've shared this before, I got a New Believer's Bible, New Testament only. I'd never read the Bible. Someone had given me a Bible because they're like, you need Jesus. And I was like, thanks. But I wanted to know, who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus that sets captives free? Who is this Jesus that comes into our messy, dark world and shines light and brings freedom and hope and joy and life everlasting? Who is that guy? That's the guy I want to know. That's the guy that our lives reflect when we start following him because it's who he is. It's what he did. When you read through the Gospels and you read about the life of Jesus, you will see over and over and over again his interactions with humanity is bringing light and life and healing and freedom and sight where there is blindness and truth where there are lies. And he is setting them free. You just have to read the word to know that that's what he does. And when I met that Jesus, I said, okay, God. He says he's your son. He says he's you. I'll follow him. I can trust him. Because I fail. I try trusting in me. But I come up short. Jesus doesn't come up short. Jesus is the one that everyone is looking for, whether they know they need him or not. And we get to partner in that. We get to be followers. We get to be people who, when they look at our, when others look at our lives, when people who don't know Jesus look at our lives, they see. Jesus, because he's changed us and he's changed the very way we live. That doesn't happen if we do not abide in his teachings. So this morning as we go into this time of reflection before communion, if, you're, if it's your first time with us, we, we participate in communion together every week. And we like to pray first and just invite God to speak to our hearts. And so this morning, as we reflect on God's word and what, he, what Jesus says, I want us to ask the question, am I following well? Am I following at all? I don't know where that slide came from. Um, am I following well? Am I following at all? And how do I make room to follow him well. How do I make room to follow him well? If you are following him well, if, if you feel like, yeah, Lord, I'm, I am abiding, I, am, I love your word, ask him who you could be sharing with. Who else needs to know they need truth? Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you. Thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before we knew we needed him, before we wanted him, you sent him. And you had planned to all along. Thank you that you're a jealous God who longs for our wholehearted worship. Thank you that you desire to be our only God.
Father, show us the things that we put before you. Show us the things that we add and have added to you. Help us to have a right understanding of your character and who you are. Show us how we're following you. And if there's anything else that you want us to be doing, I believe you're calling us into deeper knowledge and understanding and relationship with you. Would you help us to know what that looks like in our everyday lives? Thanks for listening today. We hope this blessed you and that God spoke to you. We'd like to connect with you. You can find us at paxchristian.church and fill out the digital connect card or find us on social media as Pax Christian Church on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. If this message spoke to you today, would you consider sharing this message with someone? Maybe tell a neighbor or a friend. Maybe leave a review and let others know what this has done for you. May you be inspired and transformed by God's Spirit as you step out into this world to declare that there is peace with God for everybody through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.